So I want to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So welcome to this seminar. It's um, a bit of an unusual seminar. Uh, there's uh, going to be two speakers and um, we have some guests who will answer some questions at the end as well and a whole series of really fascinating new video material that Teresa is going to share with you. Um, so Teresa Icono, who most of you know from, who's Professor of, of Rural Allied Health from our Bendigo campus, but who is been part of the leadership group of LIDS since we started, um, and myself, who's the director of LIDS, are going to speak today. We're going to talk about a project that was originally funded under the National Disability Research and Development Agenda in 2015. Um, and we're going to take you on a bit of a journey about how, how research, literature reviews, empirical research then gets translated into evidence-based training materials and how long it takes um, and the processes that are involved in developing really high quality training materials that are that are based on evidence. Um, so we're going to present to you, uh, first of all, Teresa's going to speak. She's going to talk about the context of, of this study and the context today about healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities. I'm going to give you a, a quick rundown then of the research that we undertook, which provided the basis for the learning framework. And then Teresa is going to take you on a journey through the development of the learning and training resources um, that will be launched today. And will also be launched in person at the ACID conference at the reception on the 22nd of November uh, in Melbourne face to face. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you, Teresa. Just a reminder that if you want to do the close, if you want captions, you need to to click on the the box at the bottom right hand side that says show captions. Um, if you want to ask questions or make any comments, please put them in the Q and A box, and we'll take questions sort of halfway through and we'll have a quick break halfway through um, and then we'll take some more questions at the end but please feel free to start putting your comments in the Q&A box. So on that note I'll hand over to you Teresa to do the introduction about the context that we're talking about. Right. Thank you very much Chris. I'll just forward my slide. Um, so as Chris said this is the structure. Uh, I'll talk about the policy context, hand over to Chris to talk about the research context context and now you forget to do the exciting part of talking about the resource and launching this, this kind of project. Uh, so in terms of the policy context, uh, there uh, have been quite major developments bubbling along as we've been working on this project. There's uh, Australia's disability strategy that has been um, launched, if you like, and set forward by the Australian government for 2021 to 2031. And that speaks to a national roadmap for improving the health of people with intellectual disability. Um, and that will feed in also to the Disability Royal Commission. But of course, we have the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and this project really sits within that, um, that part of the uh, NDIS that's around the information linkages and capacity building, um, in particular in terms of building mainstream capacity. So, so really focused on health as a mainstream system. And as we know, the Disability Royal Commission findings and recommendations have just been, literally just been released. And um, I'm not sure how many of you have had a look at it, but I, for Chris's advice and more partly, ordered some copies, but not the whole, is it 12 volumes or 14 volumes? Just two. And, and that needed a bit of assistance in, in getting it up off the ground into my house. So they are weighty both in terms of actual volume, but in terms of the breadth and depth of um, 
the contributions and the outcomes. And, and I think they're going to have some fairly significant implications. Um, so the thing about these three policy um, contexts, if you like, is that they all kind of focus on a vision for an inclusive Australia. Um, so the National Roadmap certainly looks at that in terms of health and health care for people, but specifically people with intellectual disability, disability, Royal Commission and the NDIS are much broader um, and go well beyond the intellectual disability. But if we focus on the Royal Commission, the key findings, that as, as we all know, the Royal Commission was months and months of hearings and submissions um, and inquiries uh, with the community providing very rich data and input. Uh, and so the summaries that came out about healthcare really pointed to the fact that um, that we've all known about for quite a long time as we're working in, in disability. But in comparison to people without disability, those with disability are denied access to healthcare on the same basis as the general community. They have worse healthcare outcomes and lower life expectancy. Um, and the Royal Commission reported finding that people with cognitive disability have been and continue to be subject to systemic, systemic neglect in the Australian health system. Now, they talk in terms of disability, but we know a lot of the evidence has come from um, people with or about people with intellectual disability. And the Disability Royal Commission had something to say about that, which I'll talk about in a moment. They also noted discriminatory attitudes and practices in terms of devaluing the lives of people with disabilities and often an unconscious bias. They talked about diagnostic overshadowing, which is where um, you assign any health symptoms or problems to the underlying disability rather than treating them as health problems as you would in any other person. A failure to listen to people with disability in their families, and this has been um, documented in the literature for quite some time as well, and failing to provide necessary adaptations and support. So we often talk about this in terms of looking for reasonable adjustments or a willingness to make reasonable adjustments to accommodate the needs with, uh, to accommodate varied needs of people with disability. Now they've got key healthcare recommendations and they really focus on expanding the intellectual disability health capability framework, which was core to the roadmap that I talked about earlier. But they want to extend it from just intellectual disability to cover all cognitive disability. So there are uh, five recommendations that speak specifically to this. Uh, recommendation 6.24, for those of you who are interested in specific numbers and have already read the whole report. Um, and that's to improve implementation planning and coordination for cognitive health capability. So extending it to, to beyond intellectual disability. Um, and that's through curriculum standards and um, other training implications. 6.25, expand the scope of the health workforce capability framework to include all forms of cognitive disability at all stages of education and training. So looking at our, um, our training of healthcare professionals, both medical and allied healthcare, um, and also postgraduate training or uh, allied health, the allied health um, workforce as well. Expand the role of the health ministers to monitor the health workforce capability development, and that's through annual reporting of progress on, uh, on progress of the actions. And recommendations 6.27 to 6.29 relate to accreditation standards and curriculum, student clinical placements, and specialist training and professional development. And I think as is the case with a lot of these recommendations, the reactions from um, both people in those workforces and the training institutions and the general uh, public are good intentions, but how is this going to happen? And those of us who work in training our healthcare uh, workforce, for example, struggle with any sort of student placements. So, you know, those sorts of 
discussions are already happening, I think. This is um, a key recommendation, and that is the National Centre of Excellence in Intellectual, Intellectual Disability Health, which was talked about and a key um, outcome or recommendation of the roadmap. This recommendation from the Disability Royal Commission was to expand the scope to include all cognitive disabilities. So they said to expand the remit of the National Centre of Excellence in Intellectual Disability Health to include autism and other forms of cognitive impairment, which is quite a broad group, if you like. Now, uh, possible tensions are, and time will tell, but possible tensions arising from that particular recommendation um, is understanding the role of specialist centres, both historically and thinking about how they might be reimagined as we move into the future, and are they going to be reimagined? Um, and so they that notion of a specialist centre has arisen from research and clinical expertise in intellectual disability health and healthcare access. We know that that's been really woeful for quite a long time. Um, and there's been a lot of advocacy by people with intellectual disability calling for such a specialist centre, um, in particular the Council for Intellectual Disability. And it's based on premises of specialised knowledge and expertise. And a question that may arise is, are they directly generalizable to autism or are we going to need to include people who are specialists in autism? Now, people who are autistic, who also have intellectual disability would already be accommodated with uh, a Centre for Excellence in Intellectual Disability, but do we extend that out to dementias and other forms of cognitive disability and will it meet all those needs? In relation to autism, we also have to be um, aware of current um, advocacy calls for um, neurodiversity affirming. And so it, it will be interesting to see how that recommendation is viewed by the autism community. Um, I think it also reflects tensions across understanding and opinions regarding what is inclusion and can you have any forms of segregation for good? Um, and certainly, just as the Royal Commission report on recommendations was being released, the first issue that was released to the media was the potential to close down all specialist schools. And I'm sure all of you were aware of um, the outcry. Like I said, there, were, there was a lot of talk back on radio, which was about, you know, how wonderful specialist schools were versus how horrendous they were. Um, and even the commissioners were split in terms of their understanding or how their opinion about how inclusion could occur within a system that allowed for special schools. So would my question is, will this extend to these notions of a specialist healthcare centre? Um, and what will that look like? So again, um, and, and many of you might know that um, Inclusive education is another area of, of interest and research of mine. Um, but for many years, there's been uh, differences in opinion about special education being a place versus a way of accommodating the needs and bringing specialist skills into a mainstream system. So there are differences in that space as well, as I'm sure there are another mainstream system. system. My final question is, does it account, does such a help specialised healthcare centre account for the dynamic, varied, complex and often pressured healthcare systems and contexts. So the question really is that um, it's not going to be feasible for people with a health concern, particularly if it's a sudden one, to be able to access a specialised centre. And is that the vision for that centre? May maybe I'm being too narrow in that. And these are all the things that are going to need to be teased out. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of support for um, this Centre for Excellence. And of course, the NDIS, which has um, provided the funding for the, the project that we're talking about today. And we've known since the inception of the NDIS that it really relates 
it funds through individualized funding packages to a proportion of people with significant and lifelong disability, but not for um, everyone with disability and certainly not in all contexts. Um, and for the NDIS to succeed, there has always been an argued need to strengthen all mainstream systems to better meet the needs of people with disability. So that includes education, employment, justice, housing, aged care, and health, which is in big letters because that's what this project is focused on. And it was certainly funded under um, an ILC grant um, that was about uh, building healthcare as a mainstream system. And we were awarded that early in 2020 which um, caused us to go through this moment of jubilation and then absolute <laughs> dread with like being handed a bit of a poison chalice because that's when COVID hit. But we've managed um, with a little bit of extra time. So we're, um, yeah, we're very pleased that that's all come together in the end. Um, and as Chris said, our resources are really a translation of the research that um, we completed well before COVID, it was like before and after COVID, of course. Uh, and and this is where our framework, which is the focus of this um, resource, has come from. So uh, with that as a background, I'm now going to uh, remove my slides and hand over to Chris. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the piece I'm going to talk about was funded before wasn't funded by the NDIS, it was funded by the Disability uh, Research Agenda from 2015. And we finished the report of it and it's a published report in 2018. So I just want to quickly go through the research and our findings because it, it, it demonstrates, I think, the evidence that underpins the resources that Teresa is going to talk about and gives you a sense of, of where they came from. Um, so we, we were very aware of all the literature and we did a fairly thorough literature review about um, what, what it said about the experiences of people with intellectual disabilities um, and their use of the hospital system. And it was really clear that people with intellectual disabilities are frequent, and very costly uses, users of hospital services. And the international literature and some and the Australian literature, primarily from New South Wales at that time, basically uh, outlined how poorly people are experiencing hospital services. But there was actually very little empirical Australian evidence about people's experiences of hospitals. There'd only been two studies at that time in Victoria, which were both from the perspective of disability service providers. So we set out uh, to understand much more about the hospital experiences of people with intellectual disabilities and their perspectives about those experiences and those of others who were involved in their journey through the hospital system. And we wanted to take a very much of a strength-based approach so our aim was to identify the individual sort of ad hoc and the more systemic processes and practices, which we call promising practices, that were accommodating the needs of people with intellectual disabilities and helping to facilitate really high quality hospital care or that got in the way of it. Um, so our participants were, were people with intellectual disabilities who were using the hospital system uh, paid support staff, primarily from disability support services, family members, and a whole range of, of hospital staff. We used a range of mixed methods. So we did, uh, we observed people's experiences. We interviewed uh, people about their experiences, and we undertook a, an audit of people's medical records. So it was a fairly thorough in-depth study, and it involved three hospital networks in Victoria, two that were metro and one that was regional. Um, and as Teresa said, we did this pre-COVID um, and, and we finished before COVID happened. So obviously there's been a lot 
happened since then, but there's no reason to believe that the nature of hospital services have changed dramatically since, since this piece of research. Okay, so that's just to illustrate, we had basically 50 people with intellectual disabilities in the study who were predominantly middle-aged men um, and were a bit representative of people with intellectual disabilities in that they had one to five chronic health conditions and about half lived with their family and about the other half lived in shared supported accommodation. Um, and we interviewed some of those people and observed quite a lot of what was happening for them. We talked to doctors, nurses, nurse managers um, and other staff, allied health staff who were involved in providing hospital services and then to people's family members and their disability support staff. And we recruited people basically by standing at the door of the hospital and identifying people as they came in because there was no other way and there still is no other way to identify people with intellectual disabilities using the hospital system. It's not recorded as a matter of, of process that somebody comes through the door and they've got an intellectual disability. Um, So with the data, which was a lot of qualitative data, we did a, an inductive analysis asking what the stages of people's hospital journey, what was it like, and what sorts of adjustments did we see, and what were the facilitators and the barriers to the quality of care that people received. So this is just a snapshot of the quantitative data, and this is actually published in an article that Teresa led which was published in 2020. So in a three month period of time for each person, they had a mean overall, they had a mean of 1.9 hospital episodes, which ranged from one to nine. Most people's episodes began in emergency. So there's a very high use of, uh, of the emergency way into hospitals and 59% people came, 59 came by ambulance. So there's a much higher use of ambulance services <coughs> to get to hospital than there is amongst the general population. And in terms of quality indicators, 62% of people in our study were triaged when they came through the door as being urgent or semi-urgent. And the average amount of time that they spent in the ED was six and a half hours with a range from one to 30 hours. So very few of them met the benchmark for their stay in the, in the emergency department. But that may actually be uh, an indicator of good quality care because it may indicate that there was a willingness on staff's part to take the time to listen to people and to give them the type of support and treatment and diagnosis that they needed. So in 91% of, of people's episodes, there were diagnostic tests included. And amongst our cohort, there were very few representations. So people didn't come back within 72 hours of discharge. And that's a really good indicator. And 75% of people had a very clear diagnosis by the time they left. About half of people went on to ward. So they left the emergency department and went to a ward. 31% went home and 19% went to a short stay unit. Um, and 95% of people had a discharge follow-up plan from when they left. So that sort of snapshot indicated that it might be taking a longer period of time in ED, and people were coming in by ambulance, but that people were getting a diagnosis and they seemed to be getting good tests and they were getting follow-up um, planning for them. So in terms of the hospital journey that people went through, for most people, obviously it started in an ambulance um, and, and in emergency. But what we identified was that there's multiple stages to the journey through the hospital for each individual. And during those stages from, from the triage nurse when you come to ED, to the ED department, the ED doctors, and then you might end up on a ward, um, you and you might along the way see an allied health physio. Um, you might see people that are doing various tests. 
So there's interactions with many, many staff who are hospital staff, who are doing their piece of the process, who aren't necessarily connected to each other. And they all require information. So that requires you as the person and maybe, and the person that's accompanying you often to repeat information over and over. And the staff don't necessarily get that information from each other. So there's multiple stages and multiple interactions. There's also multiple interfaces between people from different service systems who are involved very differently in the person's life. So part of that journey may be family members, maybe disability support workers, ambulance staff, hospital staff who are interacting with each other and all have different cultures, different expectations and different perspectives about the hospital system and what might be happening for the person. And what we found too was that people were fairly uncertain about the roles that each other were playing. So there's lots of interfaces between people, but each person doesn't necessarily understand or respect what each other's part in the system is. And often, um, as we'll talk about a bit more later, people are uncertain about their own roles, particularly disability support staff are often uncertain about the role they should be playing um, along the hospital journey if they're supporting somebody. One of the most important things about this journey is that people bring a lot of historical baggage with them, particularly disability support staff and family members who in the past have had really negative experiences of hospital systems and of being treated really poorly by the medical system. And this, these past experiences influence their expectations of the quality of care. And it was really interesting when people talk about hosp their hospital experiences, they usually start by telling you the bad experiences that they've had. And then you say, so when was that? Oh, oh, that was 10 years ago. And, and there's a quote from one of, one of the participants, one of the mothers of one of the participants in the study who talked about the nurses now in this current episode she was talking about of all being lovely. She said, all the nurses were lovely. Whereas in the past, they were really huffy puffy and they treated you as if it's all just too hard, but these ones were lovely. So it's like this baggage influences the way you think about what's happening and what you expect to happen. And families on this hospital journey often play a non-normative role. So as we see, half of the people who came in, into our study were living in a disability, um, disability supported accommodation, but often it might be their family member who accompanied them. So they don't necessarily know what's happening day to day for the person, whereas the paid staff do. Um, and there's often an expectation from medical staff that families will know more um, than, than paid staff or that families and paid staff are interchangeable, but actually they're each playing different roles. And there's a very high cost we found when things go wrong, when people make poor decisions and when there's limited access to expertise and understanding about people with intellectual disabilities, then that ends up in a much longer hospital stay than is really necessary or warranted um, by the person's medical condition. And what, what we also found was that disability staff and family often spend a long time trying to avoid hospitals and trying to prepare well for hospitals. And that's often not, not seen. So they're not using hospitals instead of local doctors and they're not using it as a sort of knee jerk reaction. They're really trying to avoid coming to hospital. And if they do have to come, there's a lot of preparation work that they do. Um, so one of our, our sort of major findings was that there's a lot of good practice um, that, that we saw throughout the hospital journey that was coming from the medical staff and all the people involved in the hospital system, that they adjusted the type of care and the treatment that they provided to the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. So they acted in very person-centered ways, they were very flexible, they had positive attitudes and high levels of professional skill. It wasn't everybody, 
but we saw a lot of that type of really good professional practice. Um, and the adjustments, and that meant that people were adjusting um, to the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. But they didn't recognize necessarily what they were doing as adjustments. Um, and so those adjustments weren't shared and they weren't taught to staff. They were simply seen by staff or some staff as good practice. So they weren't called out and explicit. And that meant that the adjustments were sort of serendipitous. They depended on the staff members individual skill, their attitudes, and their flexibility. So it wasn't systemic. It was about depending on that individual's professional skills. But for many, many professionals, they had included as part of their skill set, the ability to adjust to people with intellectual disabilities and their needs. And what we saw was that staff in emergency wards were much more flexible and much more likely to be doing good practice um, in terms of making adjustments than those on wards. We're not saying the people on the wards weren't able to do that, but it just seemed to be more evident in the emergency department because in there, there was a culture of collaboration and teamwork and having to be responsive to a very, very diverse set of people that come through the door in emergency. So there's something about the culture in emergency departments that we might be able to learn from. At the systems level, there were very few mechanisms to ensure that staff were proficient in making adjustments or, um, or collaborating with accompanying people. So the administrative systems of these hospitals weren't designed to capture accurate information about people's living situations. The fact that people might have a cognitive disability wasn't always flagged, so there was no forewarning or statistics um, about this group of people. And the discharge processes were often not very transparent and were um, hard to understand and often caused unnecessary anxiety. So even though the individual professional skills of staff, for some staff, were really good, there was no system level adjustments to take into account the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. And the sort of overall finding, I guess, we had that was to identify some fundamentals of, of good practice. The first one was that there's a primary need of the person with intellectual disability to be supported throughout the journey and that the support occurs in the interactions between the person and the other people who are involved with them in terms of caring for them, treating them or accompanying them. So support is something that, that people need all the way through the journey in whatever interactions they have with other people. The primary need for hospital staff is very person-specific information that's reliable, that's current, and about the person's healthcare needs um, or healthcare history and their current care needs. They don't need to know a lot of history, but they need very specific information at particular times during the journey. And obviously the nature of that information changes. Um, the primary need of, of, of everybody, the person themselves, the family, the hospital and the disability staff is knowing about each other's systems so that the, the doctor knows about the disability system and therefore knows who to ask or what the disability support worker may or may not know. And the discharge planner needs to know about the disability system, about the nature of what's a group home and what type of support might somebody get there. Um, and the support, the information and the knowledge needs of, of the people involved in this journey are clearly best met through a process of collaboration between families, hospital and disability support staff. So there's, what we identified was this sort of dynamic interplay between these four elements. So the next, the next slides, and I'm not gonna to spend too long on them, just illustrate some of the elements of this process and this diagram was the first diagram that was that was in our report that said there were these four elements and it's morphed into the framework that Teresa's gonna talk about. 
So support for the person through the journey was done by adjusting communication and interactions. So it was, as one of the support workers says, it's about simplifying people's communication, people modifying their communication and making sure that the person really uh, understands what's happening and understands the communication that others are having with them and that others are listening to them. Um, and as she says, no one's brushing her off. So people are, are listening. Um, it's often, as this doctor says, about spending more time with people and recognizing that it takes longer to have good communication or to provide good care for somebody with an intellectual disability. And it's about understanding um, people's feelings and being sensitive to their needs for reassurance. <laughs> and as this quote says um, from a family member, she says, as you know, when she's talking about a nurse, she held his hand and she chatted to him while she was looking for a vein. Now that might be something that you may or may not do with somebody that doesn't have an intellectual disability, but the parent felt that the, the nurse in this case was being very sensitive to the anxiety that her family member had. And another way of providing support is about flexibly using space um, and finding the right place for the person with intellectual disability, making sure that they're not overwhelmed by the noise and by that environment, and quite often allocating quieter spaces or finding somewhere where they can be on their own or finding somewhere where somebody can keep an eye on them if, if they're on a ward um, and they have difficulty communicating their needs. We saw quite a lot of, um, of both allied health people um, nurses and the doctors um, taking account of people's limited understanding or anxiety about treatments. So this nurse talks about being very sensitive that the person was going to be frightened probably by, by needles but was in pain and that they needed to do an examination. So she talked about giving the person um, an uninvasive uh, painkiller uh, with a nasal spray so that she was feeling less pain less pain, so that they were able to do an examination of, of what had happened to her. And the physio talks about um, not doing conventional physio exercises, but just keeping up the flow, quickly changing from one exercise to another as the person got distracted and then coming back to the exercise. And he talks about well, having to think on the fly a bit. And in many ways, that's a really good indicator of a really good professional doing person-centered practice, of so being able to adapt the exercises that were important, um, but to the, the level of concentration of the person with intellectual disabilities. And we, we heard a lot from disability support staff in terms of their preparations for the hospital journey. So in this example, making sure that the person had some of their personal uh, things with them, the things that were important to them that might help them feel a bit safer and more secure if they were admitted to hospital. In terms of information, it's really important that hospital staff have uh, access to accurate and timely person-specific information. And there's just some examples really here where the, the support worker um, is providing very concise, concise, quick information about the person to somebody in the emergency department, explaining that he has a very high pain tolerance, that's really important to know, and that if he's in pain, then he really is in pain, um, but also that he'd come before and nobody listened to, them, to him and he'd been sent home. So trying to convey to the emergency person that, Actually, this is somebody who is likely to be in a lot of pain, who hasn't been listened to before, so you need to take notice. So it's, it's just those key bits of information that are important at that point in time. Um, and there's a doctor who talks about the fact that the medical records don't provide key information about people having a cognitive disability, and he's not interested in knowing the level of somebody's disability or, or, or their IQ, but he's interested in knowing how he needs to adjust his interaction 
um, with the person so he's able to interact and communicate with them. So he's saying we need this information and it's not there as a matter of course. And on the ward two, um, people are obviously on wards for longer and this allied health assistant talks about how she got information from talking to the family about how to interpret this patient's nonverbal communication. As well as staff in the hospital, the person, person with disability themselves and disability staff and families need to know information too, specific information about what's coming next for the person. Um, they need to have an understanding of what's being planned for the person, what the discharge plan is and what's going to happen next. And, and that was often uh, missing. So knowledge is the next key element and that's different from information. So this was the fact that people needed broader knowledge about interacting with people with intellectual disabilities in general, for instance. So this family member talks about how the staff member was very familiar with interacting with people with intellectual disabilities, whereas some of the other staff members were quite afraid and kept their distance from her family member because the parent felt that, that they hadn't been trained to interact with people with intellectual disabilities. So it's indicating that staff need some knowledge about people with intellectual disabilities in, in general. Um, overall though, there, was a, there seemed to be an absence of knowledge across both the hospital and the disability systems um, about each other. And that really created um, barriers to collaboration and to the quality of support. So the hospital staff and the disability staff didn't know about each other's systems and they didn't know about the roles that each other were really playing. And, the, and in particular, the disability support workers felt that the hospital staff didn't really understand what their role was and didn't give them credit um, for the knowledge, that the information that they might be able to provide about the person with disability themselves and tended to ignore them over families. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the, the disability staff also felt that the hospital staff or the hospital administration in many cases didn't understand um, the nature of a group home and so made lots of assumptions about what might be possible. So understanding each other's systems was very, very important. So the accompanying people need to understand that medical staff need and detailed information that's not written, that's verbal. And it's the very specific information that they need at that point in time. So what happened yesterday? Why is this person coming here? What's changed? They don't need to have the whole booklet of the person's medical history presented to them because they haven't got time to read that. So they know they need specific knowledge um, and they also um, need it about particular things at particular times. They also need an understanding about who might be reliable proxies um, and to be uh, to identify who is going to be able to provide um, that information so that medical staff need to know who to talk to and accompanying people need to be able to tell them who is the best person to talk to. And hospital staff need to understand about the disability support system, the types of supported accommodation that there are, particularly uh, issues about decision, decision making rights, supported decision making, who can make decisions with the person or for the person, and how does that process work? Um, and they need to understand the relationships between the patient and support staff in the disability system. And bringing that all together is the idea of collaboration um, that. Um, people need to recognize each other's roles and work together. And we saw a lot of collaboration happening um, where disability support staff would come into the hospital and would support and brief the hospital staff about the types of support that the person might need. So they would provide them with advice um, and show them the sort of care um, that the person needed. And on the other hand, the hospital staff 
We're also uh, quite good at respecting the knowledge that family members or disability support staff had about, about the person and, and saw their role as working together. But there was there was this an obstruction happening to collaboration, which was nobody, particularly in the disability sector, had a clear mandate about what their role was and what they were allowed to collaborate on. So these two quotes from staff in different disability service organizations, one one staff member saying, well, we do come in and we do uh, provide advice, but we're not really supposed to. Um, and the other worker saying, well, the policy in our organization is we do go into hospital when one of our the people we support goes in and we do stay overnight and that's our role. So that seems to be a major blocker to collaboration, um, which is this sort of mandate from the from disability support organizations um, who are often taking their cue from the NDIS rules, which have been evolving over the last few years. So overall then, our findings um, provide the foundations to codify good practices. We found surprisingly high levels of satisfaction amongst the people that we talked to compared to staff experiences. We found little evidence of poor quality care um, and we saw low representations and good diagnosis and follow-up. But we saw the need um, for good practice and for adjustments that were being made to be made much more explicit and to be described in policies, in hospital procedures and in training for hospital staff, but also in training for disability support staff, which morphed into then the, the framework that provides the framework for the basis of the training we talk, tools, which is about supporting the person through the hospital journey and providing tailored support to the person by adjusting the ways that you, whoever you are, uh, interact, treat, provide care, explain and communicate with the person. And informing for uh, accompanying people means informing staff of specific information that they, that they need about the person of that time, at the particular time, and for hospital staff, informing the accompanying person and the person what's happening at that point in time. Knowing means understanding each other's systems and roles and collaborating uh, between all those people involved in this journey is fundamental to providing the right type of support and ensuring that everybody has the knowledge that they need um, in order to be able to collaborate well. So I'm going to finish there. There's a, a reference to the full report that's available and to the published article, which is about the quantitative data. So, okay, so over to Teresa, who's going to talk about this fabulous project that we've all been working on for a long time, all the way through COVID. <laughs> um, and this is the sort of translation piece of, of our research. So over to you, Teresa. And joining us too online at the moment are two of the participants in this study, uh, Gerard um, and Tracy. So they will talk at the end a little bit. Teresa's going to invite them to... Uh, she'll ask them some questions about that experience. Over to you, Teresa. Fantastic. Thank you. So we have um, a product and it's a learning resource. And I'll talk about why we're calling it a resource in a moment. Um, but this is what the landing page looks like. And um, we'll just start with talking about some of the key features. Um, sorry, I'm not I'm going to start with uh, some acknowledgement. So this is our project team. Um, and I'm reference group. Derek, can I get you to just go on mute until I finish talking about the Is that right? Yep. Sorry, could you repeat that, please, Teresa? Can I just get you to go on mute until, I, until the end when we take questions? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge the various people, our reference group came from Bendigo Health, Golden City Support Services, Eastern Health, Murella, a parent, shout out to Faye, hi, uh, a person with intellectual disability, and our key stakeholders are hospital staff, disability support staff, 
family and close others, and of course, people with intellectual disability. And I'd like to acknowledge the funder, which uh, was originally the National Disability Insurance Agency and the administration is now the Department of Social Services. And this has been a mainstream capacity building uh, project. So what we wanted to do, based on the research that Chris has just talked about, is systematically embed the documented positive but ad hoc processes. So we really wanted to take a very positive lens through what we were doing and highlight what we found already happening in hospitals rather than taking the perspective of, you know, this is what we think you should do. It was, this is what we saw you do, you know, in terms of people with disability and family and hospital staff and disability staff. Um, and we wanted to build uh, a website of resources that was structured around the framework that Chris has introduced. So, there are four pathways. Um, so depending on which group you're in, when you go to the landing page, you can decide if, you, if you're a hospital staff member and you're going to go through that pathway, a disability support staff person um, who provides direct support and more um, high level management services, whether you're family or close others, um, or if you have an intellectual disability. And um, really the first three path groups pathways are the target groups in terms of really knowing what needs to happen in this process to ensure quality care for people with intellectual disability. But for people with intellectual disability to know what it is we're trying to convey to those other groups so they can also um, advocate for their own needs or um, ensure that the people who are supporting them uh, may have been able to go through the, the resources. We always have an introduction and the introduction, as with all parts of the website, are targeted towards a specific uh, group. So this introduction I'm going to show um, is for the disability support staff. As a disability support worker, house supervisor, or as a disability support staff, you may be involved in the hospital journey of adults with intellectual disabilities. This resource will help you to contribute to their best care and hospital experience. It's based on research following the journeys of 50 people with intellectual disabilities through metropolitan and regional hospitals. This research shows that quality hospital care comes from the interplay of four elements. Knowing about hospitals and their processes. Informing hospital staff about the person with intellectual disabilities in your care. I'm just going to move into another part of ED, Jeff. Listening to what they tell you and passing on information to the person and others who share their care, such as a relative. Give a reminder about the chart in my hand overnight. Collaborating with hospital staff and any involved family members and supporting the person as they move through the hospital journey. Looks like we can go somewhere quiet. <laughs> These four elements make up the framework of quality hospital care for patients with intellectual disabilities. Cassandra and Jono, is it? That's us. Hi, I'm Lorraine. I'm here to help with admission. For many adults with intellectual disabilities, their hospital journey begins here in the emergency department, arriving either by ambulance or through the waiting area and ends at discharge. In this resource, you will meet three people with intellectual disabilities, Jeff, Curtis and Cassandra. You will see them in short scenarios at various points along the journey. You will also meet people who accompany them in the roles of family members or a disability support worker. Each scene demonstrates problems or concerns that arise and how they can be resolved through the application of the framework. 
so that was the uh, one from Fiona McKenzie, who was our narrator and provider of the instructions. So uh, an introduction like that is shown for each pathway, but it's directed, as I said, to the particular group. So, for example, um, I don't it again, sorry, lovely as it was. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the family one is directed families, the hospital staff one talks about the knowledge being about the disability support system, etc. So after the intro, we talk about the framework, and I won't go through that in detail because Chris has already uh, mentioned it or discussed it, but I just wanted to note that we have deliberately tried to convey that this is not about learning about four different steps that you just apply but being aware of this dynamic process, which is represented, we hope, by that flowingness uh, or the, the curves, the soft curves. So it's that integration of all those elements that are going to contribute to a, a, a good, as good as a uh, hospital journey as you can have when you're unwell. Um, the other feature was um, that we tried to capture is authenticity. So authenticity in the sense that um, we didn't try and depict every possible issue that you may, or a person with intellectual disabilities or their support people may face in hospital. It'd be hard for anyone to sit through that, but really to try and represent what came out of our data, what we saw, um, and with a little bit of poetic license, but you know that's what we tried to do. We tried to um, use authentic settings in our um, in our uh, video scenes. Uh, originally, we were going to do all filming at Bendigo Health, and they were quite on board with that. And then the dreaded COVID hit, and so we relied on spaces that we have at Richard University in Bendigo, um, where we train nurses and um, allied health professionals. So, uh, with the help of um, an amazing um, film company, Maytree, we were able to convert these spaces to, to try and make them as realistic as possible. Um, and of course, we have actors who themselves have disabilities. Uh, and I'm going to show you three of them in different scenes. Why are you keeping my son waiting so long? There's no one else here. We've been here for two hours. He's just getting worse. I'm so sorry. There's still going to be a bit of a wait, but we'll get him in as soon as uh, we can. Uh, uh. What makes you think your son's getting worse? Oh, he's he's vocalizing a lot. He's keeping his eyes shut tight. He he only does these things if he's in a lot of pain. Uh, uh, that must be hard uh, to watch. Uh, uh. I'll see if I can try and get someone to come and take a look. Mm. Mm -hmm. We're just going to move you to another part of ED, Jeff. No, I want to stay here. Really? He's just got uncomfortable here. Now, do you have to move him? Is he going to a ward? Now, I know it seems like a pain, and I'm sorry, Jeff, but we're just going to move you to another part of ED. It's called the short stay unit. Now, you don't have to get up. We'll just wheel you in this bed, and Lynn and Amelia can come. But why? The doctor wants an X-ray, but it could take an hour or two to get the results. That's when we move patients to short stay. And it's quieter than here for you, Jeff. It's okay. Seems like a good idea. Okay. George, can you give us a minute to get Jeff on board? In case you have any questions, Jeff. No problem. I'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, no. Hasn't anyone helped you eat? Oh, and it's gone cold now. I best talk to the nurses so they know you need help with eating. Excuse me. Yes. My daughter Cassandra hasn't had anyone to support her to eat, so she hasn't had any lunch. Oh. I get that you're busy, but she can't go without food. No, I totally understand. Look, if Cassie's lunch can be delivered half an hour later, I can be here to assist her. Yeah, I can certainly organise that. I'll put in a request to food services. And I can actually put a note on the board as well, just to be doubly sure. How about we try that? Right. Thanks for that. And in the meantime, I'll ring down to the kitchen and have a meal sent up for Cassie now. 
Okay, so we have a mixture of um, uh, either a family member. So in the first video with Curtis, who was um, obviously in a lot of pain in the um, emergency waiting area, uh, there was someone playing his father. And then with Jared, we had both the sister and the support worker, sorry, <laughs> Jeff, I'm kind of confused with the person up there, the character right through this, apologies. Um, so we had someone who was a sister and his support worker. And in the last one, we had a parent again with um, with Cassie, um, who uh, hadn't been able to assist herself to eat. And so then what we do, let's see. Then what we do, it, rather than say, okay, this is all about knowledge, this is all about knowing, etc. We apply the framework to a particular set of scenes. So it wouldn't be applied to all of those three because they're from different parts and pathways. But we'll say, okay, have a look at these two or three little clips. And now let's apply the framework. And so we'll say, okay, for this clip, it's knowing that some adults with intellectual disabilities live in group homes or other types of support accommodation, but most do live with families. The accompanying person is often a disability support worker or family member. Their past hospital experiences may have been negative. And pain, discomfort and anxiety can interfere with how a person communicates. And then we'll apply informing. So this is from um, this, this is from the pathway for hospital staff. So you need to ask the accompanying person about their relationship to the patient. So if this person could live either at home, or in support accommodation. You don't know if the person with them is a family member or a support, a disability support staff. You might ask about how available they are to stay with the patient, how the patient communicates pain or distress, and what the person is likely to understand and how they usually communicate. Um, and then you'll need to talk to the patient and accompanying person about possible wait times and strategies that you might have available to reduce their anxiety. So again, what we're trying not to do is say, this is what you must do to reduce a person's anxiety. The, the real key is be ready to think about ways, be ready to hear what the suggestion is from the person or the accompanying the, the patient or the accompanying person. Um, think about what options are available to you because they're going to differ from hospital to hospital and time of day to you know um, staff availability, et cetera. Collaborating is when you're willing to ask answer, sorry, willing to answer questions from the accompanying person, ask questions that will help you understand their role and respond to their concerns. So really respond in terms of really acting like or, or being authentic in showing your concern about their anxiety and coming up with some possible solutions. And supporting will occur when the patient with intellectual disability will feel supported because you've spoken to them directly and asked permission to direct your questions to the accompanying person, that you make adjustments or you're willing to make adjustments to reduce their anxiety or discomfort. And the accompanying person will feel supported when you respond to their anxiety with cal calmness. And this sort of speaks to that dynamic that I had talked about before, like trying to maintain the calmness. Um, tell them about what you can about wait times. Sometimes the person in ED doesn't really know, but trying to communicate to them what they do know and attempt to resolve current or anticipated problems. And finally, to really show that you value their role, whether it's as a family member or uh, a support worker or a close friend. Then we provide a summary. Um, so we try and cap off everything that's being covered in a very short um, paragraph. And we also direct the person who's going through this to a section on resources we, where we provide some fact sheets um, and some infographs and also pointers to other resources that are available. For example, if in the scenes that have been watched, there's something about decision making, we will point people to the support and decision-making uh, resources that are being developed by Chris and Jacinta Douglas as part of the need supports. And we've also provided some activities. So uh, the notion is, and this, this kind of follows a template, 
that uh, is used at LITS, and that is, it's not necessary to use this resource in terms of going from A to Z, um, but it can be done that way. And here are some activities you might want to use. So everything that we provide um, is downloadable, either as worksheets or as a whole package. So we haven't quite done that yet. We've just been finalising um, the evaluation, but, but that you'll be able to go to the website and just download load the whole thing to deliver in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, so the framework, so um, the resources that are provided under TAB, um, as we mentioned, come from research and we've provided downloads, other resources, and also the credits for uh, all the people involved. Now, I just want to talk about the evaluation. So as we were developing um, the resources, so with the videos, we wrote scripts based on what had what had come from the qualitative data that uh, Chris has um, been discussing. And then we worked with stakeholder groups in workshops or one-to-one. -one. Um, so family members, um, support workers, uh, hospital staff, and also involved one or two people with intellectual disability. And we asked them, we read the scripts aloud um, as you might do in rehearsing for a play or something. And then we asked for feedback as to whether or not we had the language right, if they could tell us what, what the key message was that we were trying to convey. Um, we corrected any technical errors that we may have had. Um, I certainly was constantly aware of the fact that I'm not uh, a hospital worker. I, I don't really know all the terms that are appropriate we did a lot of research to make sure that we were um, accurate, but sometimes that research was not based in Australia or Victoria, and so you could be wrong. Um, so we did that. Um, we did the filming. We then showed those same stakeholder groups, the videos, and again, asked for their feedback. And we did a little bit of net editing or we asked Maytree to do some editing to address any videos that, for whatever reason, weren't quite clicking, although, from memory, I don't think there were many of those. There was just a little bit of tweaking that happened through you know, really good editing that they were able to do. So once we had it all together, and we were fairly happy with it, well, I'll never be totally happy with it. <laughs> you always, your eye always goes to something, but anyway. Um, we uh, recruited some people from each of those stakeholder groups, except for people with intellectual disability, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but we asked them to go through the pathway that related to them and then to fill out a survey. Um, so the survey asked questions which just gave us a little bit about you know, who they were and what experience they were they had in this kind of person with intellectual disability in hospital. We asked them uh, about applying the framework to a video scenario. So we gave them a little bit of a um, task to do. We asked them about their engagement with and usefulness of the resources and how easy it was to use. And then more recently, we've asked people from those stakeholder groups if they could um, interview, uh, um, participate in an interview with us. And we explored application and framework and other aspects of the resource from stakeholder groups. Um, we had just a few uh, hospital staff and a few family members. We didn't we weren't able to recruit any disability staff, but they did do the surveys. Um, we asked about potential for training and reactions and comments from people with intellectual disabilities obtained by having uh, one member of our team sit with them with a couple of people and go through the website and write down their comments. Okay? And our reference group members were absolutely essential in recruiting to this evaluation stage. So I'm just going to go through some of the findings and then open this up to, uh, open this up to questions. Um, we had 14 hospital staff um, and 50% said they'd had no training about people with intellectual disability. 32 disability support staff. 53 said that they had supported someone with intellectual disability to go to hospital. And for most of those, it was in the last two years. 71% that had no training about supporting clients who go to hospital. And we had 13 um, from the family friend group and 85% had experience 
accompanying someone um, during hospital experience. And again, most the majority of those in the last two years. In terms of expectations of their learning from the resource, most were regarding uh, supporting and advocating for people with intellectual disability. So they hope they would learn more about that. Um, and about hospital processes and collaboration with hospital staff, so from the perspective of the disability support group. So here was one of the quotes. Supporting, what they expected was to learn more about supporting people with intellectual disability to get most of their supports, um, to get the right treatment and fair treatment, to have their voices heard, to assist hospital staff in best supporting and treating a person with intellectual disability. And a family uh, member said, I expected to learn more about the experience of people with disability accessing hospital services, the challenges that they face as well as the challenges that hospital staff face. 76% reported that their expectations were met and 22% that they were somewhat met. Um, in terms of aspects of the resource, um, most people found it easy to navigate. We've obviously had one or two people who didn't. Um, most found that it was engaging. Um, so blue is completely agree, orange is agree, and then we've got a uh, neutral of gray. The content was clear. Uh, we do have at least one person who thinks it was not clear at all, which is disappointing, um, but mostly found it was clear. Uh, most found that it was the videos were useful and only a few people, a couple of people who were neutral about that. The activities helped them consolidate the information. Um, so largely agree or completely agree and some neutrals and then a couple of people who disagree. The amount of content per page was right. That's always a difficult one, particularly when you're trying to develop something that can be used as training. Um, most people were felt that the content was about right um, and that the resources and fact sheets, um, no one disagreed with that and most thought that, yes, they were helpful. Um, the content being relative to their uh, practice or work, again, fairly positive. This was probably the most positive. Learn strategies to collaborate with disability staff or family and friends. So no one disagreed there or was neutral. Um, learn strategies to collaborate with hospital staff. Um, most agree, very, very um, neutral. Better understanding people with intellectual disabilities. Um, you could have one person disagree. Maybe they already knew about people with intellectual disabilities. So for uh, people outside the disability system, most thought that they had a better understanding of it and people outside the hospital system most thought they had a better understanding of that system and and this is that knowledge um that Chris was talking about what, what do you know about that system that you're interacting with that is not the system you're working in and improved understanding of good quality of care practices and supporting a person with intellectual disabilities so again largely because we have just a bit of control response there um, and improved preparedness after completing the resource was mostly in terms of knowing how to communicate and collaborate to support the person with intellectual disability, advocating for them, and knowledge of hospital uh, systems and processes. So a disability support worker commented in the survey, I feel more prepared in engaging in collaborative communication with hospital staff when I support a client to present a hospital for treatment. And from a hospital staff member, I have more understanding of how to communicate with disability workers, strategies to use to communicate with people with intellectual disabilities, and ways to show I'm listening and taking on board family support and concerns, which was an absolute delight to read those. 45% um, thought they were a lot more prepared, 50% a bit more prepared, and 93% would recommend the resource to others. And just a few quotes from hospital staff from the interviews. <clears throat> I really like the journey from waiting in emergency through to ward stage and discharge. They definitely seem to cover the majority of the issues we come across. 
I think definitely providing ED staff with this information would really help because I know a lot of the issues such as healthcare workers getting confused between an SBA, Supported Disability Accommodation, or a disability combination of boarding house and nursing homes. That was very strong in our, um, our research. We come across that frequently. So I felt that was really clearly identified in this resource. This one sung to my heart because AAC is my background and passion. I love the use of AAC, so that's augmented given alternative communication, so pitch systems in particular. Um, I love the use of AAC in videos because that really shows how they can meet the person at that at their level. I think the ease of use, I think, is really important for me, quite time poor, as are most clinicians on the ground. So I think that the time it took me to go through it, it was really quite succinct, very easy to use, easy to read. And lastly, and I think that's probably more the way that I've seen learning to be delivered previously, where it's like, well, we're going to show you a really worst case scenario and you've got to tell us what's wrong. Whereas this is the opposite, where it's like, actually, this is best practice. And, and that was really gratifying because that's really what we were trying to do. Not to say, don't do this. It was like, look at what happens in hospitals. Let's do more of this. And some quotes from family members. There have been hospital visits in the past, I think when maybe the person was much younger. So they were much easier in a way, but, I, but thinking about what that process would be like now, I think there'd be a lot of significant challenges with them being in that environment and long wait times and things like that. So this person was talking about going from when their family member was a young child to now an adult. I can definitely see the value of using something like that to prepare us for the, that experience because it would be quite a challenging Another one said, it's good you have that circle diagram. It's quite easy to remember and what we would use. This, I think what I took away from it is that it's important that you verbalise and clearly articulate what your needs are during that situation. And finally, I think from a carer's perspective or a support person's perspective, certainly it does make you pause and reflect on what actions you can take. And the videos, I watched all of them very carefully. And I think that they were good examples of how you might articulate your needs and come to an agreement. And just some final words. Um, the picture on the left is, um, is the person who played Cassandra um, and some of the other actors, some people from the team, and the May Tree team demonstrated showing our jubilation because we had managed to do the bulk of the filming in that COVID period where one positive COVID test could shut everything down. And we had film crew had who come from interstate. We had the the um organization was like a military operation. And I thank Joe Spong for assistance with that. But that jubilation was quite real. And the masks are there not just because we're displaying a hospital environment, but because we're still in a COVID environment. And um, I want to just play a little bit of um, Fiona, as, who as an example. We hope you summer. enjoyed going through this website. Here are some final things to think about. Nurses, doctors, therapists, and other hospital workers do know about person-centered care. Okay, sorry. Hospital staff can work with people who know you well, such as a parent, brother, sister, or other family member or friend. People who know you well can also work with hospital staff to support you. You can ask the people who support you to have a look at this website so they can know about hospitals, talk to hospital staff about you, work with hospital staff, and provide the support you need. I've got some medicine here for you. It's going to help you to feel more comfy. Remember, you and people who support you can use this website at any time. If you do have to go to hospital, we hope you will have a good experience. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and lastly, I went out to visit um, the young woman who played Cassandra. Her name was Kelly and her mother, Deb, and asked her about her experience. So first, I just want to say thank you. Um, we're in your home, which is really nice of you. 
The videos that you uh, helped us make were for La Trobe University for a project, Quality Hospital Care for People with Intellectual Disability. So my first question is, why did you put your hand up for that job? To help other people like me, so when they are sick in hospital, they will get better care. Okay, great. And we did a lot of filming quite a long time ago. What really kind of stood out for you? <laughs> <laughs> I remember missing lots of new people, playing Uno with Damien. Of course, I won. Of course, I also it? remember laughing a lot. You were very proud of winning, beating Damien at UNO. I remember that time too. So you played Cassandra or Cassie and there were a few scenes where you were a patient in a hospital, uh, in a hospital ward and you needed lots of help from your dad, who was called Frank, or from your support worker, who was Jono. Um, what scene really stood out for you? Maybe it was the most fun or maybe it was the hardest I liked the scene where I was in the meeting and I kept telling everyone that I wanted to go to my own home. Yeah. I had to use the communication book to let them know I wanted to go home. Now we had the second round of filming and that was the scene that you remember and that was at Bandura and that was the one where we were trying to work out where you were going to go after you'd been in hospital. So what, one, what was that one like for you? Doing the scene in Bondor was also loads of fun. I got to see all my new friends again. Damien wasn't there because he didn't want to lose it to know again. But we had a very nice lady. Oh, it was a big day. We had to get the missing scene just right. It was a very big day. I think we were all exhausted, weren't we? Mm. Yeah, I remember how tired you were. Yeah. You worked really hard and we had lots of people involved, didn't we? that were helping you. Can you tell us how they helped you with your acting? When I wasn't sure what I had to do, Damien would show me. Mum helped me too. She would say things like, sook like Uncle Ange, or get angry like when I get angry at my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, Callie, you've seen the finished videos, haven't you? Um, which ones do you like the best? When I saw the videos for the first time, I was in shock. They all looked so good, just like on TV. I felt very proud and I think I did a good job. What about you, Deb? How was it for you? Yeah, um, I, I was super proud of Kelly. I thought she um, did an amazing job. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about the video? I want to thank Teresa, Main Tree Kahu and all of the actors that worked with me in Bendigo and Bandora. I want to say thank you for all your patience and for making me feel comfortable and for being friendly. I hope these videos will make things better for people with a disability when they have to stay in hospital. We hope so too and I think they will okay? Okay. because of people like you who helped us make them. Thank you. So I'm launching this website. <laughs> so um, thanks, everybody. And that is the address. It is available for use. Uh, we will probably continue just to do a, little, a few tweaks just so that everything will be downloadable. But it's certainly available. Um, and uh, those tweaks won't interrupt the um, usability we hope of it. So just to finish up, so the resources are now live and the the website is there. It will be on the slides that will be available on, on our website. The recording of today will be available by early next week. Um, we'll send out to uh, a notice to people that that's now available. Um, We'll also, we will have the recording that was done last week of the La Trobe Ideas and Society event, which features Rhonda Galbally and Elle Gibbs and Michelin Lee uh, talking with myself about 
the Royal Commission and the NDIS review and the quarterly essay that Michelin had written. So we'll send a link out to that as soon as it's available on YouTube and much more easily easy to access than having to register as a participant. And if you are around in Melbourne on the 22nd of November, um, around five o'clock-ish, there'll be another launch in person with some of the actors um, at the, uh, the sort of welcome reception of the ACID uh, conference, which is at Crown Casino. And if you wanted to come, either if you're a conference, coming to the conference anyway, or you can purchase a, a separate ticket to come to that welcome reception. So there's another opportunity to hear some more about them. They're now live, so please, they're freely available. Please use them, share them with other people. And, and we always welcome feedback. If you've got some feedback, nothing's ever finished, is it, Teresa? You can just keep making it better. So there won't be a lid seminar next month because it's the it's the acid conference and there's a lot of a lot of people from lids will be presenting at that and we haven't got space to do anything else at this point in time um, but we will send you information about uh upcoming events so thank you very much to Teresa and, and and jared and everybody who was involved in these resources um and thank you for coming today um and we'll see you at some point in the next couple of months hopefully Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye.